Take. Set. Go! <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a 40-year-old book. This guy in the late 70s and 80s analyzed UFO pictures using computer systems and a variety of things. Now, let's try to figure out what that guy was doing, okay? What I think is that, okay, this is a monochromatic picture. Frequently, you turn everything to black and white or to one color so that you can isolate out things that are like each other uh, based on the amount of light hitting it. For example, this is all black and white, all shades of gray, but let's take a color, any one color, let's pick green, and let's put green on from zero, which is black, to 256, which is white. That's a scale. Let's say that we want everything that is 60, which is kind of a dark color. We want it to be green. So we're going to dial in green. It's called pseudo color or sometimes false color mapping because we just want to see what's what. Is the color of the sky that's up here and the sun is shining? Where is the sun, by the way? Let's find out where the sun is by getting the brightest things and where it's going to light up the blue or the white of the sky. It lights them up differently and it's going to light up on the ground if the sun is shining on the ground. Well, this is a different, this may be just one shade of brightness different, but we drastically do the color so we can definitely see the difference between this one and this one. And you turn dials, your color dials, and you may look at a picture for 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour. One picture, just studying it and doing the pseudo color in order to say, I want to see, wait a minute, on this object, the brightest part. Let's take the, let's take the one that's black, zero, 256, white. Let's take 200. Say it's a real bright. Let's take the brightest thing and turn that into red. Just so we can see it and just pick the one number, 200. Maybe let's go from 190 to 202. Spread it out a little bit. Make all that be one color so we can see, okay, here's an object that's up in the sky if the sun's up there, it's shining on that side of the object, not where we're seeing. So if it's all bright by pseudo color, we took the brightest thing and made it a definitely seeable because it's a one color. But the sun is over there shining on that way on that and this on that way. These two were shot under different conditions. The sun is, is on this one differently than it's on that one. That's one thing. That's one thing once. There are many things to do in doing pseudo color. And in the early days, 40 years ago, of computer analysis, a lot of the procedures were still being established. What can we find out? What do we want to know? Well, we want to know if, uh, if this twig is in front of this tree or behind, behind this object. Is it in front of it or is it behind it? How far away is it? Well, from with the way that our eye looks, I really can't tell because the sun's shining on it. But let's turn our color dials, our color wheels, so that we can map different colors onto different things and see... If uh, someone shot this picture of a model on a piece of film, there it is, and shot this background on another piece of film, there it is, and then put them in an enlarger and superimposed them and went high contrast. Otherwise, you could see the trees that were showing through 
through the UFO, so to say, that was in the background. So you got to make sure you position it in such a way that it doesn't leak and the image doesn't leak. But you got to get down in there and study them. Microdensitometer can tell you if too, how thick is, how dense is the emulsion. So you can get a little bit of information about if something is superimposed over the other one. If all of the edges, when you colorize the edges, make it dominant, are all identically the same, well, that means that it was superimposed, compositing compositing because it's literally like cut it out and paste it on where you cut it out there's sharp edges there even if uh even if it's shaded a little bit from the angle of where the sun is it's still been cut out so there's a new edge on the faded edge and that's what these all represent and i supplied them thousands of these photographs. I think that they just, oh, wait a minute. I'm the guy. <laughs> Caught in the act. I did a lot of these photographs. And uh, every time that we'd go to a different lab and use a different computer system, I would bring my same digitized pictures for a while, they were on mag tape, looked like a looked like music tape, reel to reel tape, uh, sixteen hundred bits per inch, and they had to have a machine to mount it, to mount it to get it into their computer, whether it was a De Anza or a Ramtech or a Comtal, different places had different equipment. I had my scanned images, which to a lot of those places that was a new new thing. You know, the, the scanners, because we both of the places, we went to labs that were inventing that equipment. We went to one at the University of Arizona and one at USC, University of Southern California, and used their, not used, I mean, participated with them in scanning using uh, what was in 1978 and 79 was a brand new thing, because there there were hardly even any color computers at the time. And it was CAD. It was computer-aided design. It was, it was wireframe objects. You know, a frame buffer to hold one still picture was a big deal. And how many colors was it? 64? No, we got 128. No, we got 1084 colors at once? No, oh, we got... Then it became a million, a million colors at once, and then 16 million. Didn't matter if it was that many colors anymore. It was, what's the resolution? How many dots per inch is the object? And then it became, well, that's too many dots per inch. We're just looking at grain. We're not looking at the images anymore. So there became a happy medium. The, 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 the quality medium for like a total picture really kind of settled at 2,400 dots per inch. 600 is a lot even in his own, on a computer when you're printing an object. If you're 600 DPI, it's like, whoa, maybe that's too much. The image is too big. Okay, let's, let's roll back 300, 200 DPI. So... These were different tests in different scan rates. We scan an object, and here, this beam ship is a little teeny tiny thing in it. Let's get a picture where it takes up more of a percentage of the picture to go in and look at it and um, look at the edges and look at the contour. That was really the main thing. Then there were two kinds of edge enhancement that we used. Edge identification, edge enhancement. So one says, okay, here's an edge. The other one, eh, it's real faint, like the way receipts you know, keep them in your purse too long, they, they fade. 
So you're going to scan them and then enhance them high contrast and make the brights brighter and the blacks blacker in order to be able to read it again. So we would do that with images just to see. You got it. You got to try it and do it. And in, in this era, every time you wanted to try something new, scanning the picture was a whole big thing. So when these brickheads, I love that term, thank you, would be saying, this is not correct and need to be done that way. And it should, how the hell do they know that? They're just making it up. They're flying by the seat of their pants. They're reading magazine stories and building it in because for sure they've never done it. I know that these people at MUFON and other UFO labs that were against the Meyer case had not one time ever, really and true, never, ever actually tested. They just, they yeah. wanted to be against something. Or they were mad at Wendell, or they, they didn't like me. Or, and I, I went to many, many, many places before I started making my own judgments. I went to, say, 50 experts, the experts that I can find at SPIE, Society of Photo Optical Instrumentation Engineers. That was my stomping ground before there was SIGGRAPH. Uh, there was a SPIE, still exists to this day. We'd find the manufacturers and the white paper writers and the different tests and the software that was being done and then come back with pictures to scan them and find out where they were selling equipment, which universities go there. To scan one picture, I remember uh, at USC, I think we were paying $800 a picture to do a scan. This is 40 years ago? 40 years ago. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Thanks to the Moody Blues and Andy Williams and Bernadette Peters, I had pocket money. Okay. <laughs> Those were some of the groups I was doing at the time. So, um, these yeah. pictures represent a tiny fraction of, of the analysis. Nine of out of a thousand or two thousand, however many. And these, uh, frequently, these were, uh, shot off of the screen and I had a four by five sheet film, I had a Linhoff four by five uh, sheet film, color film that I would sit on a tripod, no scanning, just Quack. take a picture of a computer screen. And, uh, you know, we had to do things so it wouldn't flicker and would be smooth and test all that out. And I'm sure I, I shot and developed thousand sheet film images. Polaroid, I had I had a backpack of Polaroid cameras taking color pictures, some of these color pictures. And uh, it wouldn't always uh, be good quality, but they were interesting pictures. So, this is one, two, three, four different pictures of that MiG fighter jet. And uh, this one is, is to say, okay, looking at it at its side, there's the wing. Mm -hmm. And the tip of the wing, which is closer, closer to us, that isn't a scale model of an airplane. That's an airplane. Even at that distance, yeah. we could tell because the edges are different. On this, and, and that's just, that's 12 feet closer than the body of the plane. But that's enough for us to be able to tell. Other resolution at other distance, it just turns into nothing, it turns into checkerboard. And, uh, but we would want to know by focus field indexing different objects object over there, an object over there, when you go in on their edges. 
look at the edges and count the number of pixels wide, you can put things in a bin, sort them by how many pixels wide is the edges. It's called focus depth of field indexing, focus field indexing. So depending on the f-stop and the shutter speed and the lens is the depth of field. So frequently you want the depth of field to be as shallow as possible in one set of pictures, because if something is a big object, a distance away, part of it's going to be in front of or behind the depth of field. And that's what you really want to see is that different parts of the airplane are in focus different. And that's what this is. Oh, see this part of the airplane is so this isn't it. If this is a scale model, this is a scale model. If this is a scale model of a UFO, they did a picture, a trick picture, and they got a scale model of a MiG fighter jet. But instead of, well, we got a picture of a MiG fighter jet, let's stick a UFO in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know why any of these pictures were picked to be here representative mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. I made this separate. Uh, steps one, two, this is, this is all the steps in one diagram. Mm -hmm. This is looking at it with a microscope. This is using a microdensitometer. This is using a video camera. Uh, this is using a scan laser scanner. This is using a flatbed scanner. And how do we store it? So this is just the different ways that we get, would get the image into the computer. And, uh, and, and at the beginning, I wasn't even using a computer. I was using a microdensitometer in a microscope. Okay. Thanks. For, uh, and that's all I have to say about that yeah, right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>